Uh, hello, welcome to What's the Buzz? How ADR is revolutioning, revolutionizing AppSec and Live Attack Simulation. Today's webinar is sponsored by Aligo and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech and I'm excited to be your moderator uh, for this especially timely presentation. And before we get to today's great content, we do have a few housekeeping items that are going to help you get the most out of the session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions um, in your webinar control panel in the, in the questions box. Um, and uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, that's also a good place to, to let us know about those. A browser refresh will fix most of them, but we can help you out if not. Second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. Especially like to call your attention to two there from Oligo. One is the 2024 playbook about protecting applications from zero day vulnerabilities. And then there's one on Oligo ADR. So uh, check those out. Feel free to uh, share them with your friends and colleagues. Now, uh, you've probably noticed that $250 Amazon gift card um, prize on there. That's uh, We'll be awarding that to one lucky registrant. You must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. Official terms and conditions of the prize drawing can also be found in your handout section. And last piece of housekeeping here, one of the best benefits of this event is the opportunity to ask a question of our expert presenters. So to help encourage those questions, we have an extra $50 Amazon gift card uh, that we'll give out to uh, to, to uh, the best question that came in. Okay, with that housekeeping out of the way, let's get to today's fantastic content. We've got two speakers today. We've got Mick McCulley, Director of Solutions Engineering at Aligo, and Nitsan Museri, who's a data and threat researcher there. I'm going to bring Mick on to get us started. Mick, thanks again for being here. Yes, thanks. Thanks for having us, Scott. I'm excited to get started and, and discuss a little bit about Oligo ADR. Super. Take it away. Awesome. So as, as Scott mentioned, so I'm Mick McCauley. I'm the Director of Solutions Engineering at Oligo. Um, I am joined by a partner in crime, Nitsan. Um, she will be joining me shortly and performing some live activities. Um, we're going to spend the next hour or so, I know we're running a, a little late, but um, discussing uh, ADR. And for those of you that are new to NAT, an acronym, um, ADR stands for Application Detection and Response. So it's one of the things that we built, excited about and proud about at Oligo and wanted to spend a little bit of time of sharing some of the details of why it exists, why it's important, some of the value behind it, as well as share some live examples of how it works in, in the real life. Um, as part of the agenda today, what we'll be going through is a quick introduction into ADR. What are some of the details behind it? Why is it needed? Um, some of the importance behind it. We'll go through, as I mentioned, a few live attack scenarios where we'll show you um, some attacks and how they are performed, as well as how Oligo can assist in actually making you aware of those. We'll summarize all of that, and then we'll go through some of the questions as they start to come in during the, the webinar. So feel free to add the questions as we progress, and then we will go to those at the, at the very end. So without further ado, let's jump directly into Oligo ADR. Um, I'm going to start at the very beginning, which is why do we need it, right? What, what's the importance of AppSec? Pretty basic and fundamental, but as many of you are probably aware, applications are a core part of our everyday activity. We perform tons and tons of interactions with them. Banking is just one of those examples. I've got a banking sample that's up here. This could be any bank, um, but it provides a tremendous amount of convenience of doing um, any sort of modern activity. So paying bills, checking balances, depositing funds. Um, what's interesting about these applications, in order for them to provide that convenience, the applications themselves need to have access to all of the data behind them, meaning any user that sign, signs in, um, provides their appropriate credentials, the application needs to look up the data for that individual user, meaning the application, the banking application needs to be able to see every single account, perform any tra transaction for the individual users. So that's a permission that gives the application the ability to perform those activities, but it's also a permission that attackers target, right? If I can figure out how to misuse an application with this massive amounts of permission and information behind it, I can use that to perform whatever nefarious activities that I'm trying to perform. The other interesting aspect of this is a lot of these activities revolve around um, known vulnerabilities or known techniques. So many of the attackers are actually trying to exploit known approaches. Um, in a recent 
um, study that was shared by Mandiant, they actually looked at 138 exploited vulnerabilities. And out of those 138 exploited vulnerabilities, 70% of them were considered zero day vulnerabilities, meaning there was no patch available when the, when the vulnerability was published. And so these applications were potentially exploitable with no means to actually protect themselves. Another interesting aspect of it, the additional 30% where there were patches available were exploited because the attack actually occurred within five days of the CVE being published, published, meaning the amount of time that you had to actually remediate the issue is starting to shrink and shrink and shrink. In addition to that, there is a uh, um, some additional statistics in Cloudflare that share that CVEs as of now, like the amount of them that are continuously being published is continuing to increase. On average, it's a little over 106 vulnerabilities published a day. And out of those 106, what they also said is any of them that have proof of concepts, what they're seeing is in within 22 minutes that there are actually targeted attacks against those CVEs. All of this starts to show you or illustrate how uh, all of these applications are constantly under attack and you're you're running against time trying to stay on top of them. This is where we start to come into play. And there's new, there's multiple approaches into attacking or trying to address these um, types of vulnerabilities. One of those is proactive means, right? Uh, preventative measures, just like vaccines, you predict and try to guess at how you might be attacked and use those mechanisms in order to provide preventative measures. We've seen a big focus on this with shift left. There's definitely value associated with getting ahead of security issues and be able to fix those. But the reality is too, you can't always predict every attack. Um, and in some cases, there are things that we'll talk about today, like shadow vulnerabilities, or even unknown vulnerabilities pre zero days, which is if you're not aware of those, how can you get ahead of them? There's also potential blind spots. Um, you know, in, in cases where you actually own the source code, you can do some of this inspection and controls and proactive measures. In other cases, when it's coming from other third party individuals or, or organizations, it's difficult to apply those. So what we'll talk about is the fact that, you know, prevention just isn't enough. It's a great approach, but breaches still happen, right? There, there are attacks. In my conversations with CISO, it's, it, CISOs, what's interesting that's fallen out of it is the fact that they do have a focus on reducing as much risk as possible, but they also plan for the fact that there's no such thing as 100% secure. So there is going to be a breach that happens. So being able to have a strategy in place and a plan that you can act upon when one of those occurs is extremely critical. One of the interesting aspects associated with applications um, themselves is the fact that when breaches are often detected, it's 110, 180 days past when the attack actually occurred. And this is due to the fact that most of the application um, breaches, the only way you can detect them is to look for the post effects associated with the breach, meaning is malware installed or files being uploaded, um, communication with things that shouldn't occur. A lot of these are also based upon known and unknown vulnerabilities. And then as we mentioned before, sometimes they attack vectors that you don't have control over. Third party applications being a perfect example of that. This is where Oligo comes into play. And so I've had a little bit of a medical theme as I've rolled through these slides. And what's interesting about it, we talked about vaccines and then emergencies for the breaches. Um, over on the right, I've got a picture of an MRI. Um, I use this one for, on purpose. Um, it's very analogous to the technologies that we've built at Oligo. Um, in this particular case, back in 1977, uh, Raymond uh, Demadian actually invented the first MRI. What was awesome about it, it provided a approach to be able to see inside of a human, be able to see things real in real time as they're occurring without having to be invasive, right? And so the ability to perform this inspection from the outside, but get tremendous amounts of insight and intelligence and be able to see things as they occur inside the human body gave the medical field tremendous amount of information to be able to detect and predict uh, anomalies inside of an individual. This is the exact same thing that we're using from a technology perspective of looking at applications, being able to inspect those and see inside them and be able to detect deviations in normal behavior so we can tell you when there is telltale signs of an attack occurring. 
This applies to anything from unknown vulnerabilities to something we'll talk about shadow vulnerabilities. And even those unknown zero days that, again, if you don't know about them, it's very hard to address. So the question may pop into your head of, okay, well, that's great, but how does it actually work? Um, I'll give a little bit of insight into the technology itself, then I'm gonna turn it over to Nitsan to actually show you some live examples of this running in real time. If you think about Oligo application detection response, uh, and I've simplified a version of an application that we have here, an application basically sits on top of a, a host. Um, and this could be thousands of hosts in a Kubernetes deployment with many different components and databases. But the idea is still the same on those individual components that the application is running on uh, the underlying operating system. And so you've got the code, you've got the kernel, the operating system itself, and it interacts with the kernel using the syscall APIs. Technical detail associated with it, but what happens is, is when users interact with the application, they exercise the code performs the activity, it makes the syscall, the kernel performs whatever activity it gives the end user back the result of what they're trying to achieve. So whether you're paying bills, whether you're moving funds between accounts or just checking balances, you're starting to perform activities inside the application, which in turn is being surfaced back to you the information that you requested. This is where Ologo kicks in. What we've created is this ability to see this MRI equivalent, if you will, or ultrasound of a running working application, no matter where it's running and provide inspection and visibility into what's occurring inside of the app. Be able to see the libraries, the functions and exactly what kernel level interactions are performing. So think of it as just this intelligence engine that gives us a tremendous amount of visibility. A couple of key things that I'll mention and I'll turn it over to Nitsan is um, the ability to perform this activity without requiring source code. This is why you can do it on applications, whether you build them or buy them or something else that you're using in your environment. If it's running in your environment, being able to see this is extremely critical. Installing in 10 to 15 minutes is a critical component of ours, as well as taking very minimal resources to be able to provide this intelligence information back to you, less than 1% overhead when we're performing these activities. These are all core components that we know are extremely important in order to be effective. So think about all of those sort of ideas, the ability to perform that inspection and observability on a running application, and now start to apply those into a live running attack environment. What's also very intriguing that we discovered as part of this process is when we saw these behaviors, we also realized we could learn from them. And so one of the things that we've introduced is one of the first knowledge base associated with normal profile behavior of individual elements. The ability to actually identify and look at open source components and know exactly what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is actually turn it over to Nitsan in order to actually perform some of these live attacks. Thank you, Mick. Uh, I'm Nitsan. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm a security researcher in Odigo. And we actually got into the most exciting part, which is the live demos. So we will have uh, three different attack scenarios today. All of them are uh, of real uh, CVEs, real critical uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities. And each one of them is going to uh, present a unique value of the Oligo ADR. So in the first one, we will see uh, Oligo ADR versus the uh, container runtime security tools. Later, we will see how it detects shadow vulnerabilities. And finally, we will see how it detects uh, third-party images uh, vulnerabilities. So let's begin. Okay, so the first vulnerability is uh, ActiveMQ vulnerability. You might even uh, heard about it. It was published last year. And ActiveMQ is a widely used uh, message broker, uh, open source one by Apache. And like any other message broker, it just lets applications and the services to communicate with each other, transfer data, the C. And uh, okay, so let's deep dive into this uh, vulnerability. So in ActiveMQ, there is a protocol called uh, OpenWire, uh, which is responsible to the communication between uh, brokers and clients in ActiveMQ. And whenever an error happens during the processing of a client request, uh, the broker just sends back a message uh, of type exception response. 
just to indicate the client that there was a problem. Then the client gets this exception response message and it triggers a component called the exception response marshaller, which just starts to unmarshal the message. Uh, unmarshaling in this case means it just takes the raw data in the message and that just tries to uh, create an instance of a class out of it. Uh, so it's very similar to deserialization. And the problem with this process is that it doesn't validate the type of the class it creates. It just creates a class instance, but doesn't check which instance uh, it uh, created. And this means an attacker can just craft a malicious exception response message, then uh, uh, insert to it in uh, some malicious class and send it to the ActiveMQ client. Then if the class present in the class path, uh, ActiveMQ will just create an instance out of it. And uh, it will, will happen without any uh, validation or ver verification. So uh, most of the public POCs of this vulnerability use this class, uh, class pass XML application context, in order to exploit this vulnerability together with uh, XML URL. So here is the malicious uh, message the attacker sent. And during the unmarshaling process, an instance of this class is created and the XML is also uh, loaded. Now the attacker can use this XML, if you can see here, it contains some command, in this case, a CURL command uh, or any other malicious command. And this command is, is going to be executed during the marshalling, uh, unmarshalling sorry, process. So this way we get, got a remote code execution uh, in uh, ActiveMQ. So uh, just to summarize it, um, here is how the full attack works. The attacker just crafts uh, the ActiveMQ payload like we explained. It, it sends it uh, to ActiveMQ instance. Then the unmarshalling process starts. Uh, he requests the XML file, uh, gets the XML file, it gets loaded, and then our code is uh, getting executed. So that's it. Uh, that is the full uh, flow. And we will uh, see it in action in a moment. And in addition to the oligo IDR, we are going to use also a Falco by Sysdig to monitor, monitor the results of the uh, attack. Falco is a popular container detection uh, tool. Uh, and we will see how each tool detects this malicious activity. This will just help us understand the differences between ADR and other security tools. Okay, so let's start. I will just share my screen. Okay, so before we start the attack, just a quick overview of the uh, Oligo um, platform. So here you can see the dashboard, any insights of your uh, environment. Uh, and if I go to the images tab, I can see all the images uh, in my environment. Um, if I click on them, for example, on the ActiveMQ image, we will attack them in a moment. I can see it's uh, vulnerabilities. So let's search the relevant vulnerability. You can see it here. And I, I can also see the dependency that is linked to this vulnerability and you can see it's critical. Also the dependencies of this image. And all, the, all of this data is taken from uh, runtime. So you get only the relevant vulnerabilities and dependencies that's actually uh, run in the environment. Uh, so you already get a huge value here. You only fix what is relevant. But today we are going to focus on the incidents tab. Uh, here we are going to see all the incidents, just like this example incident. And uh, it's the oligo ADR uh, create once uh, there is uh, some attack or exploitation. Okay, so let's start with ActiveMQ uh, demo.
Okay. So I'm using here a public uh, POC, the most uh, uh, popular one. And just we will just uh, check the IP address of the ActiveMQ instance that uh, runs right now. And I will update it here. OK, so the full command, I provide the POC, the IP uh, address, and also, uh, like we explained, the uh, XML URL. So let's just uh, watch the, the XML before we execute it. Oh, sorry. OK, so as you can see here, it's the XML that is going to be loaded once the unmarshalling starts. And you can see here the command that is going to be executed, just a simple uh, Linux user add command that will add a new user um, to the system called the hacker one. And like I said before, we have also Falco run, runs here. Okay. So here we are going to see uh, the alerts of Falco. So let's uh, initialize the attack. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, some antivirus problems. Okay, so it got executed. So I got I executed the, it uh, using the arguments we saw before, and now we can uh, shell into the uh, into the pod. As you can see, uh, Falco uh, didn't alert it, so let's close Falco. Falco. But let's see if it worked. Okay, so let's see uh, all the uh, users. Try to find our uh, created user. And as you can see, a new user was created successfully, which means the command executed, the all flow uh, was executed. And Falco uh, didn't uh, alert this, uh, this behavior, this user add command. And let's see OligoIDR. Okay, so we have a new incident, uh, which tells us that a suspicious uh, process spawned. And what we can see here is the full uh, description of the uh, attack, uh, remote XML loading, which led to uh, creation of a new user. And then you can see uh, the full process tree, uh, the active MQ Java, process that's created this command. And you can see also the Java call stack, which is very cool. You can see here all the flow, the stack, the actual Java stack that's led to this uh, uh, fork and exec and uh, just process creation. So it's really, really cool. And also you can observe the uh, specific dependency that was uh, related to this uh, exploit and also uh, the specific function as you can see here it's the unmarshal uh, function from openwire just like we explained um, now it's important to understand that uh, falco didn't alert anything because the problem with uh, falco or any other uh, container level tools is that they just can't look for any user add command that runs in the container because then they will have just a lot of false positives. And uh, the good thing about OligoIDR or 
ADR in general is that it looks into the most tiny level of a library. You can see here just a dependency. And then uh, it's just able to uh, detect this uh, anomaly. Um, so this was the first uh, attack scenario. Let's stop the sharing screen and moving it to you, Mick. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And I, so this is a perfect example of what we just described. The fact that the approach that's historically been used in a lot of these detections of looking for attacks is to look at the post results, look at these the effects of what happened if an attack was successful, creation of particular things, identification of malware, communication with inappropriate sites. However, to Nitsan's point, there are some things that happen within applications that are normal behavior that applications may have to perform that curl function. How do you know if the, the function that's being performed is being done by a component of the application that should be doing it? This is where this granular level of detail of identifying inside of an application, what it is that's performing the activity, and if it falls within the confines of its normal behavior. This is why the profiling capability is extremely important, as well as the ability to observe deep inside of the application without impeding the performance of that application. So this is the first example that we wanted to share. Um, I know we've got a couple other that are just as fun and exciting. So Nitsan, I'm going to pass it back to you to show those examples as well. OK, great. So um, now we move to the second uh, vulnerability. You've probably heard the term uh, TensorFlow, one of the most widely used frameworks in the AI community today, uh, made by Google. And also we have Keras. Um, Keras is a legacy framework for deploying uh, deep learning models. And in the last year, TensorFlow adapted, sorry, adapted uh, Keras as their API. And today it's just uh, part of the TensorFlow framework. It's built in. Okay, now we, before we continue with the vulnerability, let's start by understanding what is shadow vulnerability. So shadow vulnerability is a pattern we found in many uh, popular and widely used open source libraries. And those are vulnerabilities that don't have a CVE assigned or their CVE is just disputed, which means no one actually knows about them. And the interesting part about uh, shadow vulnerabilities is that in many cases, the library maintainer is aware to those uh, security pitfalls and they just consider them as part of the normal behavior uh, of the library and just uh, don't fix them. So they just tell users it's not a bug, it's a feature. And basically the library is made uh, vulnerable by design. So those are uh, shadow vulnerabilities. And in the last year, uh, the Oligo research team discovered uh, shadow vulnerabilities shadow vulnerability in uh, Keras TensorFlow, uh, which again, uh, doesn't have any CVE assigned. And the vulnerability is a critical remote code execution vulnerability. Let's understand how it works. Okay, so uh, TensorFlow uh, Keras models uh, are built using layers. It's a basic uh, concept in, in Keras and in models. And one kind of a layer is a Lambda layer. And as mentioned here uh, in the right, in the TensorFlow documentation, uh, the uh, unmarshalling of the uh, Lambda layer specific uh, layer is made in using the Marshall Python module. The problem is that the Marshall module is unsafe to use because just like Pickle, it can lead to remote code execution when using with uh, data from untrusted sources. So uh, it's a problem. And another concept in Keras is that you can save uh, models to files just to share with other people or just to save the current state of your model, just like snapshots. And there are several formats you can use in Keras. One of them is H5 format or HD5 format. And as you can see in the images, you can just save the model to H5 and then using load model function, you can load it back very simple. The interesting thing here is that as part of the flow of the London model uh, function, it uses 
it triggers uh, the lambda layer deserialization, which again, like we said before, using the Marshall unsafe module. So it's done by the vulnerable module eventually. Okay. So what we did here is to use uh, this specific uh, H5, uh, malicious H5. And as you can see here, we created this piece of code that just uh, uh, prints a message and uh, added it to the model as lambda layer uh, to the model and just saved it uh, to H5 uh, file. And then all we need to do is just pass this malicious H5 file uh, to the target. And once this is going to be loaded using the load model, model function, the code is going to be executed. And again, like I said before, it doesn't have uh, any CV assigned. It's just a shadow vulnerability. And we found some popular tools that are using Keras and are vulnerable to this vulnerability. One of them is TF Lite Converter. Uh, TF Lite Converter is an open source tool by Google. Uh, it's just a uh, transfer uh, the format to t of models to TF Lite format uh, to allow them to run on uh, edge, edge devices and mobile devices. And this tool gets as an argument the H5 uh, format. And when we uh, gave it the uh, malicious one, the code was executed. So we will see it in, a, in a action now. So I will share my screen again. Okay. So just before we start, I will show you here in the plat Oligo platform. This is the image that we are going to uh, attack. Um, and there is no vulnerability assigned. So I won't see any vulnerability here because again, it's a shadow vulnerability. Um, just, I, I will just see Keras as a dependency, but again, any vulnerability scanner or uh, any SBOM tools won't show me those uh, types of vulnerabilities. And now uh, let's see the demo. Okay. So I'm going to show you uh, the uh, normal usage of the TF Lite uh, uh, converter tool first, then we will see its malicious usage. Okay, so first I just run here script that creates a, a model, TensorFlow, TensorFlow model. Okay, so here is our uh, TensorFlow model. And now we will just run this command, just a normal usage of this tool. Let's see it. Okay, and we can see that uh, our model uh, has changed its format to TF Lite format. And now let's see uh, the H5 that we already created. So this is the malicious H5. As you can see, this is the command that is going to be executed, just creation of a file. Uh, then it uh, saved to H5. Okay, so let's create this H5 model. Great. And then I'm using, again, the TF Lite convert and giving it the export H5. And let's see it. Okay, so I can see it created, uh, it transferred the format of the file to TF Lite. Let's check if our uh, file was created. Okay, it was created, which means the attack worked, the uh, malicious file was created, the code was executed, the code in the H5 uh, file again, in the Lambda layer. Now let's see uh, Oligo IDR. Okay, so I, I've got here a new incident telling Keras spawned a suspicious process. Uh, actually, the Oligo IDR detected here again uh, the deviation from the all the things that Keras is allowed to do. And 
we can see here post spawned and created a new file we can check out the uh, dependency page with all the other images that contains uh, the Keras uh, library and again I can see here the function which was related to this uh, exploitation the calling to the lambda layer all the environment data and again the process tree which called the uh, creation of the file and of course the python stack sorry about that the python stack with all the uh, all the callings you can see here the libraries that were involved involved in the stack that's eventually created a, a new process so that was the uh, attack scenario of keras uh, shadow vulnerability that OligoIDR was able to detect. Awesome. And that, that thanks, Nitsan. Um, that's a perfect example. And there's a couple of things that I just want to make sure are very, very clear in that, that example, um, because that was one where uh, Nitsan was able to attack uh, a library without a published CVE. That's the idea behind shadow vulnerabilities. Um, these may be vulnerabilities that were surfaced to the maintainer, uh, made aware that there is a risk inherent to them, but in some cases are considered disputed, right? That the capability in there is by design. If you happen to use it in an insecure way, that burden is on you and it creates a risk inside of your application. So this is something that you can't just scan and identify and find this risk. And in this particular case, we're discovering this attack scenario by observing the behavior of the library without having to have a CVE. Nitsan pointed this out at the very beginning. There was no CVE associated with it. However, the use of the library in a specific way creates a risk. So there's a couple of things here. One is to look for the attack of something that you're exposed to, which you may not be aware of. The second one is actually a way to look at a running application to see if maybe the misuse of a library actually puts you at risk. So more of a proactive way of identifying those risks, even though they're not CVEs. It's an interesting aspect of being able to have some of this transparency and observability deep inside of the application and one of the things that we help focus on. So Nitsan, I'll let you proceed with the next example of third-party images. Thank you. Okay, so we got to the last scenario and everybody love uh, log for share so we kept it to the end. Um, so I'm sure you heard the name log for share, log4j. It's a very popular open source uh, logging library uh, in Java developed by Apache. And you maybe heard also a, a, of uh, Apache Solar. It's an indexing search platform also by Apache, um, also written in Java. And it's very popular also. Okay, so uh, in December uh, 2021, a critical remote code execution vulnerability was discovered in the super popular log4j library. Um, I guess you have heard about it, maybe the most uh, known vulnerability in an open source uh, in the last few years. And the issue was due to uh, uh, improper input validation in uh, JNDI in log4j. Um, Inside uh, log4j, there was a feature called JNDI message uh, uh, lookup. And this feature allows attackers to load and execute arbitrary Java classes they made from a remote LDAP server. Uh, so they got a remote code execution uh, like that. And after the log4j vulnerability was made public, Apache published a post telling which of their products were affected by this vulnerability. And apparently uh, Apache Solar uh, 8.11 uses the vulnerable log4j version, uh, which made also Apache Solar uh, vulnerable to this attack. So we will go uh, quickly uh, on the attack flow uh, for Apache Solar. So first the attacker uh, sends uh, get request to a specific URL in Apache Solar and it inserts to it a JNDI lookup string. Then log4j, which is a dependency of Apache Solar, processes this input and connects to the attacker, the green part LDAP server. 
and then the LDAP server redirects this request to another server, also of the attacker, uh, the blue one, HTTP server, which contains, uh, holds uh, the payload, and the payload uh, is returned to the victim and uh, it's uh, executed. So we already prepared a live demo, but we have no time. So we, I will only sh uh, share with you the uh, incident we created before uh, in the platform and what we can see about uh, uh, this Log4J attack. So this incident, you can see here, Log4J spawned a suspicious process using JNDI injection. And I just want to share with you all the details. Uh, so here you can see uh, the library, the vulnerable library dependency, again, of Apache Solar. And the image Apache Solar uh, in the version uh, 8.11, the vulnerable version, and the function, which is JNDI manager uh, dot lookup, uh, the vulnerable function. And uh, here you can see the process tree, a creation of uh, the command I was executed before. And the coolest part, uh, in my opinion, the call stack, Java call stack, which actually shows you all the functions, again, the JNDI lookup, which called uh, the load class, the class loading of the malicious class, and then the process creation, which is pretty insane. You can get all this data uh, out of this incident. Um, so this is the log4j incident, uh, passing it back to you, Mick. Of course. Uh, it's. I always smile when you say the coolest part is the call stack being a security researcher. So it makes it makes makes sense. Um, that's that's awesome. I know we ran out of time for the live attack, but as you can imagine, just as Nitsan attacked the other examples, the same thing would have happened here. The interesting part, and I think the thing that we wanted to convey is the fact that um, these vulnerabilities, these risks, involve in your entire architecture, right? Whether or not you built it or bought it. If it's running in your environment, that risk is exposed there as well. And when Log4j was published, the reality was that a lot of the risk was actually in third-party apps. And it's areas that you did not have control over or the ability to actually understand if the risk existed and you were dependent upon your vendors and suppliers to give you that detail. This is where we believe that this changes the game just a little bit because what we're given or what we've created is the ability to actually perform this inspection on all of the components running inside of your environment. So any application, whether you build it, buy it, use it, stole it, right? If it's, if it's there, um, the ability to actually perform this observation, identify these anomalies and make you aware of them, right? So the ability to actually know when an attack is occurring as opposed to waiting for all of the post side effects of a breach after it's occurred and trying to trace that back and understand how did it actually occur. So that's that's the idea. And, and it's on. Thank you very much for going through those examples. I think it illustrates a lot of what ADR does and how important it is and the ability to have that observation capability on top of a running application. So next couple of slides, we'll just talk about and just quickly in summary, reiterating the idea that one of the things that we've been able to do because of this ability to see this granular observation is to actually build profiles of normal behaviors, understand exactly what components are supposed to do, what their intended behavior is, and then be able to identify those anti-patterns or anomalies. So this one an example of PyYAML, which is a YAML parser, should be able to read and parse files and write to memory and interact with the OS. However, it shouldn't execute code or communicate with the network. And if we see those behaviors, knowing that it's PyAML spawning those is our ability to actually help you identify that this is an anomalous behavior. It's a telltale sign of an attack. And again, the most intriguing part is if you take a step back, most applications do have to execute code, communicate with the network. But being able to identify it's if it's a specific component that's in, supposed to be performing those activities is the most critical part of being able to be effective at identifying those. And identifying those without modifying the application, having tremendous amounts of overhead associated with it. So with that, I want to summarize and then we'll, we'll open it up for any questions. I know we're very limited on time that, that breaches happen. Attacks are going to happen, right? We, it's very hard to predict every single type of attack and put measures in place to stop those from occurring. 
So one of the things that we know is extremely important is be able to identify in real time. Um, and real time just means a running application to us, whether it's testing or production. For real attacks, obviously production, but being able to see those um, techniques and approaches and testing can be performed anyhow in any application, whether you build it, buy it, or if it's being used in your environment. Being able to detect types of attacks, whether known or unknown, right? Deviations, the latest version of Log4j that could be trusted, if it performs and starts executing code in your environment, you probably want to be aware of it, even if nobody's published a CVE. And then be able to provide, and quoting it's on the coolest part, right? The contextual proof associated with it, with the call stack and the trace and be able to tell you what deviation occurred that triggered that type of attack is extremely important to actually understand what occurred. All of this is built upon the fact that we believe that we can deploy and scale and have very minimal impact on these applications, but give you a tremendous amount of insight gives you one more control point on your application infrastructure. So I know we're right at the top of the hour. Um, Scott, I'm going to pause there, see if there's any pending questions. I know we've got just a little bit, bit of time, but um, we'll, we'll at least see if there's anything that we can take. Yeah, we did have a couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, one, uh, they're asking, given this desire to implement as quickly as we can, what differentiates Oligo from uh, your competition in driving a faster implementation and faster realization of the benefits of ADR? It's, it's a great question, one that we kind of just um, went over fairly fast. And some of it's based upon the technology that we've implemented underneath the, um, the covers itself. So we do have our own intellectual property that allows us to perform these installations without modifying the code. Um, but we've also leveraged under, underneath something called eBPF, which allows us to actually have a very non-intrusive way of identifying and viewing and observing these applications without having to have any modification. That's the piece that is extremely critical. And we, like I mentioned before, we, we do installs 10, 15 minutes. It's just simply having our, our sensor deployed where the application is so that we can perform these activities. And the way eBPF is architected by nature allows us to have very, very minimal impact on the actual overhead associated with it. That's probably one of the biggest ways to do it. Proof is in the pudding there, um, being able to actually see it firsthand. Okay, excellent. Um, thanks for that question. Uh, next one, they're wondering, in scenarios where zero-day vulnerabilities are discovered, how does ADR interact with other security tools to provide a unified response? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. One of the things that we focused on today is the ability to identify this anomalous behavior. Um, but we also know we're not the only security solution most organizations will use. So the ability to actually share, publish that, push it out to SIM stocks, make everybody aware that this particular activity occurred and provide all of those details that Nitsan actually had shared. Um, not to overshare too much, but we've also figured out a ways that we can start to implement some protection mechanisms in place. It's something that we're in process of actually embedding inside of the product, which gives us the ability to have a unique approach to actually solving some of these issues too. It's very exciting and we know it's actually doable and we've, we've done it today in our lab. Okay, uh, Temper, probably just a couple more. Uh, one here, mm -hmm. in the case of a zero day exploit originating in a third party vendor software, how would ADR handle the threat if it doesn't have visibility into the vendor's code? Yeah, and that's, so the, the last part of that question is probably the most important part, which is we don't need the source code, but we still have visibility into the running application. So we are seeing the libraries and functions. So we can actually see inside of that running component. And that's the core component that allows us to identify that anomalous behavior. The last example that Nitsan just showed, shared, um, was an example of a third party application where the attacker was abusing a CVE, um, a risk inside of that application that was creating that anomalous behavior and using a library to perform activities that it wasn't supposed to execute code on a server. And even though it was a third party app, we're still able to observe that deviation. Very cool. All right, great. Well, you know, it, it looks like we're we're just about up on time. But you know, Mick, if, if somebody wanted to get started uh, with Oligo or, or find out more, what do you recommend? Yeah, definitely uh, hit our website, reach out to us directly. We're happy to um, show you the product, go in more detail. Um, we're believe, big believers in proof is in the pudding and seeing it firsthand. So we want somebody to actually understand, experience the product and see exactly how it works so that everything we just walked through, you can test and see for yourself and understand sort of the value and impact for it. 
Awesome. Oligo.security.io. Right. Yep. Okay, super. Well, Nick, uh, Nitsan, thanks for putting together a really informative presentation, uh, all those great demos and, and the insights here in the Q&A. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna let those two go uh, and uh, we'll go on to our last piece of business here today, which is the prize drawing. Oh, and actually I'll leave this this slide up just so if you do wanna contact um, either of them, you've, you've got their uh, their contact information. But the uh, the last piece of business today is the Amazon gift card prize drawing. The winner of the $250 Amazon gift card is David Crowell from Connecticut. So congratulations to David Crowell. We'll be in touch to get you your card. And with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I wanna thank Aligo for making this event possible. And thanks as always for attending, for your great questions. That's gonna to conclude today's event. Have a fantastic rest of your day.